Welcome to Build. I am Jack Saunders. We are live in London right now with Josh and Max from You Meet a Six, everyone. Yeah. Hello. Fans are in the building. How are you doing, guys? All right? Good, good, good. Everyone at home all right? Good. Um, by the way, if you want to send questions at home, you can. Just below in the Facebook comment section, you can put some questions down there, or you can tweet us at Build Series LDN as well. Gents, how are you? Fantastic. You excited for the football tonight? There's no words that can describe how excited I am. For this I evening. woke up with butterflies in my toilet. I've, I've not, I've not quite sorted out my body from Saturday. I think I'm like on a <laughs> four-day come down. Oh really? Yeah. Well, you're just gonna have to go straight back up again, aren't you, for the I football am, tonight? I plan on it. I plan on not having any brain cells left. Obviously. You said you're going to Hyde Park tonight. I am. Yeah. Where are you off to, Max? Um, bit more low key. I'm going to Richmond to see it with some friends. I don't, yeah. think, I don't think I can handle Hyde Park and oh, watch really? it. If I was watching the You're lightning, one. He's, he <laughs> loves it. You know, he's the, I, I love it. He's avid going out, watching all the England games and just, he's smashing it up for us, which is great. Strong, strong Josh. Um, beforehand, Josh said to me, he was like, oh, I'd really like you to catch me out with a really tricky question. So I thought I'd open up with something. I didn't say that. No, I mean, you did. <laughs> well, mm, I think you did say that. I, so, said, I said I don't mind a tricky question. Well, yeah, I'm going to ask it. You shouldn't have mentioned it then, should you? Yeah. So would you rather be attacked by 12 duck-sized horses or one duck si horse-sized duck? I've heard that one before. Have you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, when I was at school in, like, year three, and they asked me that. Um, and my answer... <laughs> That's not to my gear off, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, we've only just met. You made yeah. a great impression. Uh, the same, I, I think, look, if you get 12 horses that look like ducks, is that what you're saying? Yeah, the, that, the size I, that, of ducks. Because it always confused me, that question, because ducks are quite friendly, I think. I mean, asking the question is the hard thing, I think. Yeah. Head around it. I think I'm going to go with the big, the big ducks. Okay, good. Yeah. Maybe we should get onto the album. We the could. Music. We should probably do that. We could we? do that, yeah. Um, what would you go for, by the way? Let's not leave him out. He gets very sensitive if you leave him out. Uh, yeah, I get a little bit sensitive. I think I'm going <laughs> to go for the uh, 12 smaller sized ducks slash horses. I agree. Whatever, yeah. You don't want to be trodden on by a horse sized duck. Yeah, I think that would be... Imagine the beak. <laughs> that would be quite a big beak to come at you, so... I don't think either you or I really understood the question, did we? I, I think the, the technical we, term is a bill, actually, we, but... We both answered we? with such hesitation. <laughs> <laughs> Should we talk about the album? Yeah, yeah, yeah let's please. do it. Um, so, off the back of Night People, the last record, um, how did you feel after that, w w leading up into this record? Was it... Did you feel like you had something to prove after Night People? Because you come back so soon? I think we had a lot more to say, to be honest in, with you. I think, Josh, would you say? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think um, Night People is one of those records that felt like a stepping stone record. I think a lot of... I think most artists have it at some point in their career where, like, I wasn't personally ready to make a record after Cavalier Youth. And we, when we started writing Night People, I was like this is going to suck, or at least I'm going to suck on it. And in the end, it didn't suck too bad. It went okay. But, like, it, I think the thing about this record is that we were all in the mindset to make a record and all really wanted it. Um, and I think that, you know, starting up our own imprint at Cobalt on this record has probably been the best thing we've ever done because we signed to them when we'd already made the record. So they didn't really have a choice for a say in what was good or what wasn't good. And I think perhaps... Sometimes in anything you do in life, in any profession, you can get inside your own head about whether or not you're fulfilling expectations or meeting um, your level, so to speak. And I think that was definitely uh, sort of a byproduct of night people. Yeah, you can overthink things, can't you? Totally, man. And just yeah. get on top of yourself and so, maybe lose that focus and concentration. You have yeah. Before, right? Yeah, totally, man. Did you feel there was a point where it, it suddenly clicked for you? Was there a moment as a band where you had a discussion or was it someone you spoke to? I think we were on tour in Germany, and Max is quite a prolific songwriter. Like he's always writing, and we were on tour in Europe. And uh, Max was like, "I'm gonna start writing a new album now." And I was like, "The last one came out six weeks ago." He's like, "Yep, yeah, but let's go." And I think um, when somebody has that sort of that fire in their belly, it can be quite infectious. And I think we all realised that the diff what happened between Cavalier and Night People was we just took a long time to make a record because we didn't write songs for like three or four years. And we were like, we're not gonna do that again. We need to, now we've got the ball rolling in terms of being creative and writing, we've just gotta keep going. And so that's what we did, I think. I right? think maybe the way to look at it is that 
without night people, you wouldn't have written six. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, I yeah. think, well, like Josh said earlier, you know, we needed to write that album. There was a little bit of a transition in style of songs and our influences that we brought onto that record. And we didn't fully go for it. We kind of dipped our toes in a little bit where I think looking back on that record now and making six was like, no, we're going to really go for it now. We, we've looked at that record and seen what we did and what we enjoyed and maybe what we didn't enjoy so much from that record and brought it to this record. And for us, it was just having fun. And I think that's the key staple point of this record, I think, for us, is we just want to make a fun record that people can put on and sit up and dance to on a Friday night. You know, there's definitely songs that have that feeling, but then there's also other songs on the record that are a little bit more meaningful and have a bit more of a purpose to it. I mean, from the first two that you've released, fun is one word to describe it. it I, like, when I first heard 3AM, when I first heard Fast Forward, I was like, this is, this is You, Me at Six all over. This is how this band should sound. I mean, for me personally, Fast Forward, I love. I absolutely love that. Congratulations on that, by the way. It's well, absolutely huge. Was that, the, was that the start of the process? Was that the first one that you wrote? Well, yeah, I would say that was... It wasn't the first one that's made the cut of the record, but I think Fast Forward was the song that really brought the energy to making this record. I remember we wrote that song in November, didn't we, Josh? And then we went away for a week to a place called The Dog House, which is a studio where you can go and write and just be friends and make music all night long. Be friends. Be friends, you know, hold each other's Only, hand, one, only one week a year. Yeah, when you go away and you have and that glass. And you forget about them for the like, year, yeah. That guy sucks. <laughs> yeah, so I think when Josh and myself were like, oh, we write this song called Fast Forward, you know, we played it to the guys and I think they were like, whoa, like that's got some energy behind it. And it kind of kick-started writing songs that week. You know, I think we achieved four songs from the record from just being away that one week because of having Fast Forward there. Yeah, it was like a, like a catalyst moment, you know, like a flag in the ground. And I think every record has it. In the past, it's been, um, I remember when we wrote Loverboy for Sins Never Sleep, that was like the song that set it all off and we just went on a roll and wrote song after song. And I think, yeah, the fast forward is that song which like, when you're trying to make a record, you bang your head against a wall for like months and months and months and then one thing happens and it all goes from there. But like this, the thing that freaked me out about this record is we didn't really have that. We just sort of like, we were just sort of writing sort of over the summer, being like, what's going to come of it? And then when Fast Forward happened, it was just the floodgates opened. And as Max said, I think another thing that I found with Night People, I don't know if you agree about this, but like we didn't do any residential songwriting. So that's when obviously you like go off to a house and you just, it has a studio and you write. And we were doing like a thing where we turn up to Dan's house because he's got a studio there. And we like that's Dan Austin, right? No, no Dan Flint, the oh, guy, okay. the, the drummer guy. <laughs> and um, it's a great drum impression, the, the, by the yeah, way. The, the vest and uh, and like it was it was good at the time, but like what we found is in terms of learning between night people and this record was that when you go, you can't be, you can't choose when you're going to be creative. Like it either happens or it doesn't. And I think we put a lot of focus on going in at like nine to five and almost doing like a. a a job essentially whereas when we went to the residential we went to what two or three before we actually started recording we did monkey puzzle we did yeah. doghouse yeah and like we wrote some of our best songs at like two three o'clock in the morning when you know obviously some things have happened mainly the pub some beverages yeah, that's exactly <laughs> and uh and i that's when i think you're at your most sort of not confident, but you feel like the inhibitions go a little bit. You know, like I'm, I'm hoping that some of the people in the audience have seen us play at live at some point. And, and usually we're kind of at our best when we've had a few drinks, either before or during the show. Because you just sort of, you think, oh, I don't really care what, you know, if I do this silly little dance move, it's on me, it doesn't really matter. Whereas if you go into something and you're very serious, and I think that was... Overall, that was a, a feeling I had throughout night. People was like, everything just felt so serious the whole time. And we're not really, not talking like tongue in cheek and like, you know, that sort of vibe. But we don't, we take our music seriously, but we don't take ourselves too seriously. And I think I mean, at the, the end of the day, you're performers, mm -hmm. aren't you? You know, you're, you're up there performing for these guys and the hundreds and thousands of other fans that, that you've got. And if you lose that, then you've lost the whole essence of why these guys loved you in the first place. Yeah. Because you're doing it for them at the end of the day, aren't you? Yeah, no, <laughs> no. 
<laughs> no, I'm joking. Yeah. Um, the rest of the album, is it similar to 3 a.m. and Fast Forward? What else can we potentially expect from it? Well, I think for the reasoning behind 3 a.m. and Fast Forward being a double A side is you get a taste of what's to come. But it's not, it has a mixture, you know, like I think 3M shows the fun party side of the band, but then the DNA of Fast Forward is still Yumi at six rocking out, giving it some welly. And, you know, there's a lot of good mix across the record. You're not, it's not going to be those two songs repeated eight more times. It's, there's a song called Pray For Me, which is quite different for our band. You know, we've, we tried different instrumentation and different ways of writing music on this record, which I think has only enhanced us as a band going forward which hopefully will allow us to make more music for the future. So even though you, you maybe felt a bit of pressure after Night People, you still weren't afraid to, to no, go on? That's the polar opposite, man. We, no? felt, we felt pressure after Cavalier Youth, and Night People were like, can't get worse than that. <laughs> so we just sort of like... that bad, come on. No, no, but I, I, but I mean, in terms of pressure that we put on ourselves, yeah. like we just went to be like, we're like, as far as we're concerned, we've done close to everything we wanted to do with this band in terms of milestones. And obviously, as, as you said before, it's a testament to our to our fans that have taken us to the Wembley Arenas or the O2s or the number one record or whatever. So we're just purely doing it now because we want to. And anything that comes our way is just sort of a bonus. And after Cavalier Youth, there was just a lot of stress and pressure around making music where that didn't really happen on this one. And... I think the main strength of this record, I don't know if you agree, but one of my favorite Yumi 6 records is Sinners Never Sleep, and it's mainly because it, it's so diverse across the record. You could have a song like Bite My Tongue sitting next to Crash, and I think this is the first record since then where you can have that every song is its own island, and really the only thing that ties it all together is the fact that it's Yumi at 6 making it. Other than that, it really could be anybody do you know what i mean like it's just so many different things going on which is exciting i think well the best way i think we've been describing it for us is we threw the rule book out we didn't want to be like well this is how you write a song and this this is our lane you know because i think from everybody in here knows that we listen to a lot of different styles of music and we just wanted to throw that into our music and have our own interpretation of that and being like let's not be afraid to throw something funky in there or something urban like in there because we listen to that on a that's daily what basis music these days is doing yeah you know everyone's mixing with everyone now well, that's the joy of something like Spotify, Apple Music, Deezer, however you consume music on the move. You're not being like, this is what you can only listen to. It's here's everything in one platform and embrace it. You know, and you notice with artists at the moment, they're not being scared to work with different artists and do something different. Like, look at somebody like Muramasa, for example. He's just worked with Nile Rogers. Would you ever have thought that would have happened five years ago? No. So Oh, you check him out, man. He's yeah. very good. You need to know the hit. Well, I mean, <laughs> we've heard a lot about the album and Fast Forward and 3 a.m. Maybe we should check out you guys playing it live. This is from Download Festival. We really stitched you up there, didn't we? Sorry? We really stitched you up there, didn't like, we? I did myself. It's a nice jacket. I'd wear that every day. I, well, you know, it's weird if you go and like, do your shopping in it. People are like, wah, wah. <laughs> That's a fruity jacket, my it's, friend. Like, I live in Hackney, and I know that they aren't going to be about you, it. Well, yeah, I mean, you get away with that in Hackney, for sure. Well, in certain parts That's of normal Hackney. in Hackney. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say down Dawson Junction, you know, they love that. <laughs> no, yeah, there's cool, a man. few bars around Dawson that I would be okay in, I think, <laughs> more than okay. <laughs> now, from that video, though, because that... How, had you played it maybe once or twice before, before that game? Just the once, yeah. Once yeah. before, yeah. right. So people are already getting involved in that. Do you feel like this, fast forward, do you feel like could be your biggest track? I don't know. I think there's there's that crazy thing where, like, you know, before when you said, oh, you, you do it for them, by them, I mean these lovely people in here, but the thing about our band is that we've always written music for ourselves and then just been completely perplexed as to why people like it <laughs> or at least why do they like it as much as we do so we're like the five biggest they're probably just as weird as you are maybe i don't I mean, know so we might it, be a bit weirder right it would it would take some beating but um but yeah and i think fast forward for us was collectively like a song that the reason we wanted to put out as max is a double a side with free m was because we felt it was indicative of of what our band does well which is hard and fast and pissed off, and that's kind of what we do well. Um, and then there are other times we can do stuff like 3M, which, you know, in the past you've had songs like 
I don't know, reckless or liquid confidence, which has got that pop sensibility to it. Um, we brought a bit more funk, though, this time around. You brought some... What do you, you call it? Noel Rogers on the bit album, maybe. Bit of Steez. No, no, Noel Rogers. I was just channeling the inner yeah. hit maker in myself, thinking, well, how do you do Let's Dance, but in You Me at Six version? Is there something that you're really proud of talking about on, on the album? Is there, you know, a topic or a, or a theme or...? I, de- um, I, get, I get asked this question a lot because there's, like... I think people think that when you write a song, you have, like, the next song in mind for that, or they'll be, like, what's sort of, like, the theme or the story in this record. But I kind of, in a kind of narcissistic way, I sort of use each song as, like, uh, I don't want to say, like, a journal entry, but I've always used You, Me at Six as just, like, this platform to just say what I want to say, regardless of the context of it. And I think, actually, at times when... When I was 16 and we were writing songs on Take Off Your Colours, there was a reason why a lot of our fans were t- between the ages of, like, 14 and 16 because I was writing about the stuff that they were going through as well. And then I think over years that's quite, sort of developed more and more, but I can only ever write from personal experiences. I've tried to, like, write songs about dragons and mythical creatures and it just doesn't resonate in the same... Can't quite pull the Alex doesn't Turner resonate thing, yeah. in the yeah, same yeah. way, no. So, um, But, you know, there's Dragon Force and stuff if people want to listen to that kind of stuff. Um, but if they want to hear, like, just a really weird dude just talking about his life, then they should listen to You Me at Six every now and then. Yeah. So you've had four top five albums, which is pretty yeah. good going. It's pretty this, this musical climate as well, like, for a rock band, that is, that is pretty damn good and deserves a lot of credit. Do you ever feel pressure from that at all, but you just, or are you just going for it and just writing what you feel? I think that's what happened after Cavalier Youth. There was a bit of pressure, definitely because of the number one album. It was like, you've reached this point now. You've got a number one album. Now how are you going to do the second number one album? When they said that to you, I like to imagine them saying it in that voice as well. The X Factor voice. Now. (laughs) Good. You me a six. That's good. Fifth album. Is it going to be another number number one? One, Uh, one, one. one. Don't forget the echo. Very important. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So I think for us, going back to the topic, um, without the X Factor voice, I think just don't overlook it. Just don't overthink about it as well because that's when you kind of get swallowed by that idea of, oh, we've got to do this and we've got to achieve that. And no, music's not about that. Music's art and it's an expression. You know, I think the way you dress, what you listen to. It's an expression of what you want to be and who you want your persona to be uh, come across as. So, well, Currently, I want to be on holiday and mm. you want to be in Japan. If that's what <laughs> yeah, about. definitely. I, no. d- I do think that's massively important, and especially for rock music at the moment as well. It, it needs an identity brought back to it again. You know, it ne- it needs a culture to really bubble underground again to really blow up like it did. Well, it's been because, the pl- well, I mean, look... No disrespect to hip hop and grime. It's a fantastic, it's a fantastic music genre, and it's doing great at the moment, and it deserves its time. But for us people that love rock music and love rock and roll, I feel like it's our duty to for you guys write the bangers and for us to make a culture and make it bubble. Well, it's been neglected. I feel like, and I don't mean that in a in a bad way, but it's good that other styles of music have been pushed because grime music was a big thing and it just been, kind of been pushed away for years, you know. Like, look at somebody like Wiley. He's been doing it for 10 years, no recognition, and finally he's had his time, you know, and I love that because everybody's got to have their moment in the sun, but, you know, there's, there's a great bunch of artists in the rock world out there that you actually don't know about. Like, we were talking about Anteros, you know, like backstage, they're a great band, but do people know about them? No, because it's not... Not yet. It, well, not yet, no, but, like, it's not being shown out there where there's a lot of other things being forced into people. And I think... Well, I can only say one thing about rock fans. They don't like being told what to listen to. And I think you only go and find out about the artist because you've been told by your friend or you've heard it on television or the radio and been like, wow, actually, how have I never heard of that before? So there's definitely a lot of bands yeah. in the UK flying the flag right now, I would say, sure. for rock music. And it's only a matter of time as well because it just seems like it's a forever. It's just a cycle that goes around on a musical scene. You know, it always comes back around. And for me right now, I'm looking at the scene being like, it reminds me of the 90s. And the early 2000s when, like, it sounds weird, but, like, Usher, you know, was a massive thing in the 2000s. Like, come on, confessions, burn, <laughs> big, big songs. And you think it's crazy, but, like, it's, it's here now again. It's like 15 years, the musical world just turns around. Mm. I, th- I 
to add to that, I would say that like when we were coming through emo, is it like the its height? So you had like Mike and Chromance, Taking Back Sunday, Paramore, Fall Out Boy, whatever, when they were coming through. But that's because they were good bands, like really good bands. And I think sometimes when people talk about, oh, is rock getting the recognition it deserves? Well, it will get what it warrants. You know, like if the bands are good enough, then actually culturally that a scene does develop. And I think uh, whilst we've been in the, over the last few years, I've noticed bands like Blossoms, and the 1975, and, and bands that are sort of more more in the lane of like indie rock. I know 1975, for example, a bit more poppy, and the New Blossoms record's a bit more poppy. But like, I haven't really, except for a handful of bands like Raw Blood, who obviously came through the last two or three years, or Amazons and bands like that, I haven't really been blown away by anybody. And I think what what's actually going to happen, we're about to go into the next 18 months, where us bring me... 21 Pilots, Amazons, um, Catfish and the Bottom, and we're all coming out on new records. So actually, if there was ever a time when it all sort of comes, Death of Anna, like when it all comes together, that's how you get, get, get that sort of cultural blueprint and imprint that you're talking about. It's time to come together and make a noise, yeah, I think. so maybe Absolutely. that's what's going to happen. Are we, doing, um, are we doing audience questions at all? Do we know? We are. So would anyone like to ask a question? Who's ready? What's your name? Where do you come from? Hi, I'm Emily. I'm from East London, SD Exporter. Yes, Emily. Nice. Well, go on. Near go to Hackney. Emily. Yeah? Chinkford. Don't what? Chinkford. Chinkford. Oh, yeah. Not too far, yeah. Um, Good vibes. So, aside from night people, if you could change something to where you are now, what would it be and why? Good question. I would, I would also like to counter that. I wouldn't change the night people album or experience because I think that... Without nine people, there is no six. And I think that, um, and I mean that wholeheartedly, I think that you can only, in anything you do in life, you can only reflect on it with like just transparency and honesty. And I think when I look at that record, I know I could have done better, but I'm glad that I didn't because it means this record's sick. So it's like that kind of had to happen. But I've, again, we have this conversation a lot. We're like, oh, if we could go back in time, like what would we do differently? How would we change anything? But all of everything that's happened to this band is just, in my opinion, and it's just my opinion, is a direct result of five lads just completely blagging it the whole time. Like, there's, there's been no master plan, pinky in the brain moment in some little cell somewhere. I've been like, do you know what I mean? Like, we ha there's, yeah. nothing that, there's nothing we could do again differently because everything we've done, the good, the bad, and the ugly, has sort of been a setup for where we are now today. So I think, and I also would use that in my personal life as well, like, whether it be my friends and my family or, or whatever, is that everything that happens, happens because you've allowed it to happen, or you've wanted it to happen. And therefore, the results of that is just, it's just the reality of what's going to move you forward into the next thing. You just so. got to adapt to what's in front of you as you go yeah. along, haven't you? You can't, you can't plan. You never know what's going to happen. You can make plans, man. Those plans change. Everything sure. happens for a reason. Exactly. I was just going to say, you like took the straw. words out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Hello, what's Hi. your name? Where do you come from? I'm Hannah. I'm from Kent. Hi, Hannah. Um, I was wondering if either of you had a favourite album, like that for, for recording it. If there was one that was most fun to record, I I don't know. Just I find myself having fun at everyone because I'm a bit of a muso and I just like being in the studio. Like Good everybody, tell. well, <laughs> everybody. I've got a nickname in the band. It's called Taskmaster. 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 Yeah, so um, I'm always the p person that's going, yo, guys, let's get in early. Let's go. Let's go. Let's work till whenever you drop down and you fall asleep. Let's go. So um, I would honestly say that the last record, Six, because we kind of co-produced it with Dan Austin, and to kind of have a bit of that rain on the music you're making is it was quite... It was refreshing because it's always we've worked with some really great producers, you know, from Garth Richardson, Neil Avron, Jakir King have all made massive worldwide successful records. And then on this record, it was like us with our friend Dan Austin going, it's our time now. You know, let's try and really 
go for it and do all these things that we set out to achieve. And he pushed us to make this record. If there was something that we weren't happy with, he'd be like, I can see you guys are not vibing what's up. And I'd be like, oh, that, that guitar line's rubbish. It doesn't sound good. Maybe it's not the right play. You go, right, scrap it erase it and let's go again and what's and they really go in depth with it and I think that's what the enjoyable experience this record was is try new things do something that you've never done before because that takes you into a world that could make you maybe your best song or you learn something from that and go oh actually because we've done that now it's allowed us to do this on this song so I would say that this record's been a great experience for us additionally <laughs> uh, for the polar opposite reason, Cavalier Youth, because it was basically... Oh, yeah. So basically we decided that like every band has that moment where you can just waste somebody's money. <laughs> and that's exactly what we did. We rented like a 10 bedroom mansion in Griffith Park in Los Angeles for, th for four months. And we were only there for three months. For one of the months our friends just lived in this house and like had parties. But that, that summer, I remember Dan, we were like, we used to, we had, a, we had a roof that we used to jump off into the pool basically every day. And we were having a 4th of July party. started the day. Oh, off some, the roof, honestly, into sometimes the pool. you climb the roof. That's and a good way to wake do a little, up. Mate, to be fair. It was not bad. Um, <laughs> and I remember we were having a 4th of July party. And, and I was like, looking around in this house, being like, I don't know anybody in this house right now. And I don't know how they've all got in, but they are. And Dan turned around to me and was like, we will never ever have this again, just to just enjoy it. And I was like, but you know when you're doing something really good, you think it will last forever? And I thought that summer was just gonna keep going and going and going. And it was like, oh, we're flying home tomorrow. I was like, oh man, just one more week of that madness and be good. So that was, I enjoyed that. I love working with Neil as well, but I just enjoyed yeah. that sort of like, us all living in a house together and you know, our partners and our friends. Did you get your deposit that, back? No. <laughs> no. And in, surprise, in, in surprise. all honesty, we spent a lot of the budget on keeping the pool hot. So the <laughs> no. pool was like... What, in LA? Yeah, we kind of had the pool temperature up a bit too high. Well, we left the hot tub on the whole time, which <laughs> is not what you're supposed to do. And then our clean... What was our cleaner called again? Uh, the lady could come like... What, um, anyway, this, yeah. she, <laughs> she stole... She stole, like, one day, like, we were leaving for the airport and, like, this truck arrives... And I thought they were like the gardeners doing something. And then like we went to go shopping and then go back before we flew off. And like loads of our gear was missing. Loads of, I don't know why we had merch, but I think we'd done a tour in America and we'd been storing it at the house. All gone. And like we were talking to us like, where is our stuff? She's like, Que pasó? Que pasó? And she, all of a sudden, she couldn't speak English. She's been speaking perfect English the whole summer. And like Consuela off yeah, of yeah. Oh, come on. Yeah. I thought we had something good going on, but you, you've been planning we, this. We, she we played you, her, she yeah, played we played us played massively. We tipped her nicely as well, and she didn't yeah. really look after us at the end. Well, we still like, wow. didn't give your gear back. No, well, no. no, we still don't know where it's it is. Brilliant. It's probably on eBay yeah, right now. I was going to say, yeah. And that house was haunted. The house was haunted, yeah. yeah. Who had the biggest supernatural experience? I think they had the biggest bedroom. I was like, me, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a walk-in steam shower, my own balcony. I had to fight the skunk to get to my bedroom. Nice. <laughs> yeah, you had a little uh, lack of seat, didn't you? Like I in had, an outhouse. Yeah, I had the maid's house, and I was like... <laughs> you I'm, had the toilet outside. I was living the dream down my maid's house. Every night I was going down, I was like, oh, there's that skunk again. I've got to fight past you. Um, <laughs> so I was kind of out of the madness, and everybody's like, this house... You sure that from... wasn't just you from the night before still going? Maybe. Who knows? Is that like Hey, anything can happen again? there. No. God, no. <laughs> um, I think, uh, actually, our friend Matt from Tonight Alive, I think this is when we noticed something was going on. We're all hanging out in the house having a few drinks, and he's sitting in the kitchen, and when you're in the kitchen, you look that way, and you can see all the way down through the house to Josh's bedroom. And he's looked right, uh, and living room, yeah, it was a massive bedroom, wasn't it? He looked right, and he just goes white. And he, like, honestly, I've never seen somebody go so pale so quickly. And we're like, what's up? He's like, I've seen somebody just walk through the house. And we're like, there's nobody else in the house at all. What are you want about? And he's like, no, like, he, he was getting nervous and shaking, like, anxiety was kicking and being like, I don't feel comfortable being here. So we're like, that's really weird. And then the last night, wasn't it, I lost my phone, and it was in the, in the point of the really weird part of the house. It was like, 
going downstairs to Dan's bedroom and then it was underneath the house. I'm like, where's my phone gone? Like, I have full battery. I had it in my pocket and it's just gone missing. Four hours later, I find it underneath the house, underneath this bit, underneath. I'm like, that's really weird. And my phone was turned off. Um, that is okay. weird. The, the thing and then someone find Derek Akora. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. it, it was one of those things because we always had people over and the house is, it, it was probably one of the biggest houses I've ever been in in my life that you just thought that like, we, you'd wake up and be like, oh, that door's been open the whole night or that door's been unlocked. Like there'd be so many times I'd wake up and like my bedroom door, which I'd locked from the inside, you know, locked from the inside was wide open and I'd be like, Maybe I did that, but you know, again, you're in California. You actually started questioning your own sanity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, <clears throat> and it was just, I think it was on a, the house was built on like an old burial ground. Yeah. Um, and it's actually where Billy, is it Billy Joe? Billy from Joe Green Armstrong Day? from Green Day. He like actually lost his mind in this house. And like they, they were recording and living there and like, in the pool house, they, we had to, well, we didn't, but somebody went and painted all over it, but he drew, like, painted and drawn all these, like, crazy, crazy things. And that, I think, was something like Trent or something from the band was, I don't know what his name Trey. Was. Trey, sorry, yeah, Trey. I don't really know <laughs> much about people's names. Trey Cool. Trey Cool. Trey cool. cool oh, yeah, he's rock. like, oh, I know, I know. Like, he's, he, yeah, yeah, he does that little yeah. thing. Happiest drummer ever. Ha- the happiest yeah. drummer of all time. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think there's like recordings cancelled or leaving. So I think that's why we got this house on the cheap because everyone was just like, that went there was like <laughs> just not in a good place. So yeah. Well, was that Hannah that asked? Hannah, yes. that was an amazing question. Thank and that was so the much. longest answer. Yeah. But you, it of was a great time. It was the best question of the whole thing. I was put to shame by you there. So thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Guys, I'm really sorry we've run out of time for fan questions. Just a quick from you guys over on Facebook as well. Um, Thomas says he's unbelievably pumped from Manchester in November with loads of heart eyes. Oh, he's a mad for it. He'll be down, he'll be down the front. Mad for it. Um, someone's written something in Spanish, so excuse me if you're Spanish and I can't read this really. Uh, Mil, me encanta esa campera, which translates to, I love that jacket. Cool. It's a strong there jacket, you isn't you got a it? That's, on it? That's more, a a, that's more of a that. statement than a question, though, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I was, think that, I was yeah. making sure. Thank you for correct making no, me look silly. No, again. No, no, no. Thanks. I was like, I was trying to. It was like, is she asking me? Does she want the jacket? If so, she can. Oh, there's no way you're giving that away. Yeah. No way. The right, the right um, price. Well, thank you very Never much, know. Josh and Max, thank ladies you. and gentlemen. Please, round of applause to the boys. <laughs> Josh and Max from You Me at Six, brand new album Six is out in October. Thank you for watching home as well. See you later.